was the very hardship of life that stimulated their incredible resourcefulness. With an overpowering urge to survive, certain insects began pooling their resources to form a defense against the treachery outside. In a climate of deficient rain and sparse vegetation, the harvester ant took the first primitive step toward agriculture, gathering seeds during periods of abundance to store them below ground, where they would provide food for the colony during the months of drought. While the adults are out working in the field, the young take on the responsibility of child rearing. Gathering the eggs and larvae into a communal nursery, they tend the infants and the unborn with the meticulous care of a midwife. There are several stages of fetal development, and each is attended differently. The specific instructions carried chemically on the skin of the larva are as clearly readable to the nurse ant as a written prescription. For the soon-to-be-born larva, a pre-digested formula must be made, the nurse ant regurgitating it directly into the newly formed mouth. As soon as the young are born, they must take over the job of nursing, freeing their own nurses for work in the fields. Into their subsistence diet falls an occasional gourmet's delight. A dead bee becomes a banquet, and they will guard it with their lives. The instinct to harvest is akin to the instinct of greed. To a neighboring colony of red harvesters, the temptation has become too great. Over the carcass of a bee, they plunge themselves into destruction. Like a battle of gruesome robots, once they begin, they cannot stop. With their own parts strewn upon the ground, they continue to fight, the battle ending only when the last of them is dismembered and dead. Let it be said of the harvester ant that he displayed more than one similarity to man. As a scientist, I would very much like to have been on hand during the first seven days of creation. I would like to have seen the ironic smile on the Creator's face as he gave each creature a different strength, knowing full well that eventually only two among them would be left to fight for what remained of the Earth. That seems preposterous. Here's a little fact for you. Today, as most other animal species are diminishing in population, only two are definitely on the increase. Man and insect. Man, because he is the only creature with the ability to radically change the earth. And the insect, because he is the only creature who can adapt to whatever changes man can make. When you see him in a certain perspective, it is we who are the dwarfs. He who is the giant. He can pull an object a hundred times his weight, jump a distance fifty times his size. And if he's carrying the right kind of juice, kill tiny creatures like us with a simple bite in the back of the neck. 
assuming for the moment that he is our opponent, let's see in a physical sense what he has going for him. Face is functional and without expression. Only eyes and a mouth, just enough to keep the rest of the body alive. No muscles to smile with or frown with or in any way betray what's lurking beneath the surface. You'll notice he has no ears or nose, but don't think it makes him oblivious. He can see us and hear us through a thousand tiny hairs that warn him of our presence in every pore of his body. Compared to man, he's considered primitive, but for this reason, he's ultimately more durable. Their life begins as ours, the fertilization of a single cell. of creation seen in this minute is the product of six short days. In the time it will take a single human embryo to develop, this insect could reproduce 401 billion, 360 million of his kind. Unnoticed and unloved, they come into this world possessing all the knowledge they will need for an entire lifetime. None will teach them, none will shelter. Programmed from birth to death, each has inherited the total sum of 300 million years' experience. They are born now because the lessons were learned then. Physically, they are a miracle of engineering. Their skeleton is on the outside, allowing greater leverage to muscles within. They move by a system of hinges, flexing an infinite variation as the situation demands. Air is taken not by lungs, but directly into the skin, by a body that acts as a bellows. Defense mechanisms are everywhere spikes and prickles, stingers and thorns, burning chemicals and poison spears that jut angrily into the air. Like a finely honed machine, his jaws are sharpened as they cut, his feet giving firm foothold, extending his mobility into areas where few others dare go. Even his heart is something alien. A colorless substance courses through his body in response to the spasms of a transparent chamber. 